All contents, including opinions and views expressed, are ours alone and does not necessarily represent the opinion of the City of Wilmington or its employees. The City of Wilmington has not approved of and is not responsible for the content of this podcast series. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to The Cop and the Shrink, a podcast exploring mental health, law enforcement, and societal issues from the perspective of a police officer and a mental health professional. Have questions about current events, social media, mental health, or police matters? Visit thecopandtheshrink.com. Let's get this episode started with your hosts, Harold Bozeman and Dennis Carradin. And welcome to The Cop and the Shrink. We're at episode 11, my friend. Episode 11. 11, uh, Episode 11. So make sure, for everybody out there listening, make sure you follow us on thecopandtheshrink.com. Go to the interwebs and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our very, uh, very uh, emerging or self-satisfying, no, that sounds horrible, but follow us on our, our Tiki Talks. Our TikTok is actually doing really well. I think we will do exclusive content on on uh, OnlyFans at this point, but you really don't hear much about <laughs> OnlyFans anymore, so just follow us on uh, traditional social media. It's good to see you back and alive. I'm not sure there's anything about us that would sell a subscription on OnlyFans, my uh, friend. Yeah, I don't think there's a uh, thing. Uh, I see you on TikTok all the time, these really hot models that say they like dad bods and people over 40 and <laughs> stable. Mean, give uh, it a shot. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So you had the COVID. I did. I had the COVID. Bad. You feeling all right? No, it wasn't that bad, actually. If there's, I've had, I've had honestly, seasonal colds that made me feel worse. The The only thing that, that uh, led me to the realization that it was the COVID was the fact that I ate a lot of really expensive food that I didn't taste a bite of, <laughs> not a single bite. If uh, word to advice for our, for our viewers and listeners out there, if you're going to go to Disney World and buy expensive meals, make sure you don't have the COVID when you get there. Oh God, yeah. Oh yeah, you don't need the COVID for that. But you're doing okay I'm otherwise. Doing much better now. I I went solo the last time. We just did just the shrink. <laughs> it went so it felt weird. It it literally felt like I was cheating on you. It was it was very bizarre. Well, you know, I mean. The world's not the same place without me. Right. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> we got we to keep you around a little bit. Got to keep you around. So we got we got some good t- topics. Normally, you know, we, we always walk in and we basically have this little pep rally at the beginning, the planning section, and then we start talking about, about the different topics and we go back and forth. I was prime. I was prime because you weren't here the last time. I was prime for these topics today. So I think, you know, we, we do get jazzed up about topics. At least I do. I get very jazzed up about topics. I think both of our topics today are current events, I think are going to be uh, possibly explosive. So uh, if anybody has any comments, make sure you go to our YouTube, uh, go to uh, anywhere that you listen to the, the podcast, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Anchor, whether it's um, Apple Podcast. We're, we're on all the podcast feeds right now. And who now. knows? We might even stay on topic this week. <laughs> we, 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 we may. I, I doubt it. But go anywhere and make a comment about this because these are these are things that that all of us, including including our producer Denny, have have noticed in our world, and we actually at our planning meeting started getting a little little riled about this stuff. So, topic one tonight, and I and I brought this up because I've seen it happen. I have actually gotten several 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 uh, referrals in in my private practice about it, but wanted to throw out the weaponization of words but let me talk about the referrals first all right so we let's give a backstory to the front story let's hear it we we all remember tiger woods right Right. and then tiger woods was i think this was his his first second third beat down after the before the accident or whatever it is elon found out that tiger had slept with a hundred women 50 of which all worked at the same denny's i think it was (laughs) Elon chased them, beat them with a, beat them with a, a golf club. <laughs> Surprise! They might have had a golf club in the house. That he was she, like the she... Irvin Johnson of golf. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he came out very quickly and said that he had a sexual addiction, and that's why he cheated on her. Okay, that that was that was the story. Okay, this 
past couple of weeks, I've probably had over a dozen referrals, all stating that they got caught cheating and they have a sexual addiction. Well, that's funny you mentioned that, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> we, were, we were actually talking about addiction as we were walking into the studio tonight and we about were. how, yes... Yes, eventually an addiction takes hold of someone. Right. I, don't, I don't know if I buy it about a sexual addiction, but we were talking about substance addiction. We were talking about how eventually an addiction takes hold of someone and becomes something that you need treatment for, whether it be behavioral therapy, psychiatric treatment, or medical treatment. An addiction becomes eventually something that you need treatment for. But we also said that every addiction starts with someone making a choice. Like making, making a, a choice. Decision. Now, I, I don't know if... I wouldn't put sex addiction or, or sex addiction <laughs> into the same category as, as a substance either because some you know the, some of these substances, they cause both a physical and a psychological dependency, and it's something that you need treatment, you need professional assistance to break free from. I, I think sexual addiction, on the other hand, is something that you need um, Jesus as, <laughs> as a scapegoat for your crappy behavior. Right. Well, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not, obviously, as, as a mental health person, I'm not going to step back and say that there isn't the possibility of having a sex addiction, right? There's not a possibility of having a porn addiction, you know, or internet porn addiction. There's not that possibility, you know, there, there, there is always a possibility. However, this is what comes into the weaponization of words, is that if we use I have a sex addiction to explain our behavior because we want to step out of our relationship or, or our marriage. We're weaponizing words, right? And, and we discussed it in one of the earlier episodes about how people use uh, PTSD oh, yeah. as, as an excuse, as a, as a justification. People that, people that probably don't suffer from PTSD, but they throw the term around. This is why I did this. This is an excuse for – in fact – Let's talk about how um, someone used an excuse of PTSD as as a way to cover their excuse of having a sex addiction. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. We we've seen that. <laughs> so we can you, know, you can. The problem is with these diagnoses and with these different things, people are using them as an excuse um, rather than recognizing them as a as a real like medical or psychological need. Well, see, and I, I go a little bit further with that. I, I agree, 100% agree with you that they use it as an excuse, but I think they also use it as a weapon. And, and we'll talk about this, and, and we'll probably get into Karens and Kyles of the world when we talk about weaponization of words, and we'll define those in a second. But I think we use them as a weapon. I think we use that term or that phrase as saying, I have a sex addiction, so you have to forgive me, and you have to understand that this is an addiction and I couldn't help myself. This was the, the so the Michael Irving of the world of in, in, in uh, for the Dallas Cowboys, when he was busted on cocaine charges and was wearing a lime green suit and legitimately looked at the judge and said, well, I don't know what I was doing. I was walking down the street and all of a sudden I fell into a hooker who had cocaine on her. And that's how I became addicted to sex and cocaine. Sweet. <laughs> Not because you have a ton of money, not because you think a little too highly of yourself, not because possibly hookers and cocaine are kind of fun. No, no, no. I want to weaponize this to get out of trouble. Right. And, and, and may I say, it's setting, setting yourself up to have an excuse in the future when, sure. when Tiger or, or uh, Michael Irvin or whomever backslides again yeah oh tiger got caught again i told you i was addicted i still need help yeah yeah so now <laughs> good god so now you constantly use this term sex addict you know i i'm addicted to put it this way so our our our, our well our, our our position on weaponizing words what is and i and i think i could say this i i could ask this very honestly is that for any officer out there in the world what is the worst type of call that they walk into i think the most or, or, <coughs> volatile me, the most unpredictable the most volatile kind of call that we go to would, would be the domestic and i i hate to use the word routine for anything that we do because it's always an unknown right you, we're always walking into an armed encounter right at least right. one person there is armed um, and in situations like that that have the propensity for volatility and violence 
Um, you just never know. And it's the unpredictability that makes the domestic dangerous. Because right. when we walk into the domestic situation, it's because someone called and they wanted assistance. When we get there, a lot of families will fall back into, and rightfully so, fall back into protect the family mode. Right. So now there's an outsider in our house that wants to take part of our family away, maybe the sole provider of the family away. Now we've gone from we want your help to we're now we're all fighting with you instead yeah, of with yeah. one another. Yeah. And and so that becomes a dangerous situation. Um, so in that case, how many incidents have you gone to? Uh, you probably uh, there's probably not a, a number that you look at where the one spouse was caught cheating. Oh, I mean, that's... Or the partner or whatever it is. A large number of the domestics we go to started with a discovery of infidelity. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it gets violent, right? Right. And then and then I think that natural course afterwards, like you're saying, is, is very right. They come in and they go, oh my God, he's going to jail or she's going to jail. And they're the ones that provide. They're the ones that watch the kids or whatever. So we rail against the police. Now the police are bad for doing their job because of the call. Or maybe not bad, but just are now the adversary, right? The we've come in, <coughs> excuse me, we've come in and it's time now to take someone away. Right. And like you said, we're now we're removing, maybe we're remo removing the breadwinner, we're removing the caretaker or whatever. Right. right. Um, and so not necessarily viewed as bad, but, but now it's become adversarial because right. at the time they called, they thought they were in danger. They thought they were in jeopardy or something violent was happening. Then we get there now that everything's calm. Right. We want to take someone away. They just wanted the calm. They right. just wanted the safety. And now that the safety's there, we should leave. Right. Not taking into account now that we've heard about the crimes that were committed, we have to take someone with us. We have to do something to stop this. Right. Because ultimately, if you leave, if the police leave at that point, you know, and it's still kind of violent or there's there's volatility still involved, you know, the, the idea or at least the thought could come up that somebody could die that night, right? Well, I mean, yeah, honestly. in Delaware, and I think by this time in most jurisdictions, in most states, um, there are certain things that trigger a mandatory arrest. Sure. When you go to a domestic and, and there's a checklist, one of these things have happened. Someone must be arrested. And in some cases, both must be arrested. So it's it's not even that we would leave if we could choose to. Right. We right. go there and we hear about something that has happened that mandates this arrest. We we have to take arrest action. Right. And so that's I'm, I would never discourage people to not call. But understand, if you're going to call about a domestic situation and something has happened, something physical has happened, someone's getting arrested. Right. right. What, what was that? The old Chris Rock skit? You know, if 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 the, if you get a cop to chase you and ass whoopings coming with it. <laughs> It, it's it's ultimately you call and say, look, you know, I, you know, my husband's spouse, you know, whatever has been cheating and they it became violent and you call the police in. The police are going to show up and they're going to do their job because they have to do their job. They have to protect, you know, that's that's the way it's about. And, you know, we're going to we're going to talk about doing the job a little bit later with this. But but my point with this <coughs> one is, is that here here comes that weaponization. You know, and, and I say this in the best best of terms, is that that person that ultimately was caught cheating, the infidelity, typically can be classified as a few things, right? Now, I, I will step back and I will say, as a therapist, do I understand stepping outside of the relationship? Do I understand that as a therapist? Absolutely. I understand that. There's multiple reasons. People give those reasons and so forth. As a as a married person as a person in the world do i condone it i won't condone it to me if you are going to cheat on your spouse leave them just leave them because ultimately what comes with it is too much but i think that's that goes into the personalities that i want to talk about and, and put out there is that people are not in that mindset there i think the the types of people that i want to talk about ultimately are the folks that almost and dare I say it, you know, use that infidelity either A, as a weapon, or B, as almost like a, a badge of honor. I, I still got it. Right? Yeah. I can still do this, and I can still get away with it. I can still get away with it. So, Which which brings us back around to our original topic, right? The, the topic we took 10 minutes getting to that was supposed to be the <laughs> focus of this segment. When the inevitable breakup happens, right. now we, we weaponize these terms, right? So what... What do you hear most often 
after after there's been a breakup, you always hear and and you, you've seen the videos on the TikToks right. and you've seen the posts on the Facebook. Um, you always hear, oh my God, he was such a he was such a narcissist. A narcissist. Or or you know, I had to get away from her. She's a psychopath. She's a sociopath. I had, right. So we we're, we've started labeling people with these diagnoses right. and. And let's be honest, most of the people that are placing these labels on folks have no idea yeah, what no. the diagnosis is, but we've heard it repeated so many times oh, God, yeah. that any any boy who breaks your heart is a narcissist. It's it's gotta be that. It, it, it can't be it can't be they're just a shitty person. You know? <laughs> well, you know, let's define them out a little bit so everybody can can understand them. So a narcissist, you know, you have to you have to think about it. Narcissism has has the term itself has been around since the late 1800s, early 1900s, and and uh, my man Freud, which actually is funny. Laura and I were talking about that last night. That I I had said if I sat down with Freud right now, and she stopped me. She goes, "You would listen to every word he says and possibly hug." <laughs> and I was like, "You're you're, you're probably right because I like the man. The man, you know, was cool." But the reality. He defined the term narcissist based over the in Greek mythology of of Narcissus and and his twin sister Echo, which basically it was Narcissus had seen his reflection in a pool. I think pool. that's too many sisses. Sis, Narcissus. 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 Yeah. Narcissus. Too many isses. Two isses. So that dude and his sister, Narcissus, <laughs> and his sister, he he would see a reflection in a pool of water, and he loved himself. And he loved the reflection. He fell in love with the reflection to the point where his sister died and he eventually killed himself because he couldn't bear to see his image because his image reminded him of his sister, but also ultimately took that self-loathing. Okay, so Freud defined that narcissistic uh, personality as somebody that was grandiose about themselves, that was particular, that didn't care about other people's feelings unless it fixed them. And basically they had an over overinflated self of self love, self, you know, pride and all this great stuff. But typically they're pretty ugly inside. It is what it is. They step on people pretty much. That's a narcissist, okay? Sociopath, a little bit different, okay? No. Uh, I'm not aware of these feelings that you humans express, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. A sociopath doesn't understand empathy. It doesn't understand it. Ultimately, can't provide an empathetic response to people. A narcissist can learn how to be empathetic, can learn somewhat, learn how to be empathetic. It takes a ton of therapy, a ton of self-reflection that ultimately they have to get past this, this self-love that, that is maligned sociopaths no empathy they can't understand it they don't know what it is and so forth we see a ton of sociopaths um people that uh what was it was it um a pretty woman with richard gear and he was this raider that would come in and he would you know rip apart companies and sell them and buy all this and you know this almost stoicism that they're there we see this a lot we see this a lot about um, even like uh, coaches at, at the NFL level or, or at the pro level mm -hmm. is where they, you know, family lives are completely shit, but they are completely into into the, the uh, operation of whatever sports team because that's all they can focus on. So that's different than a psychopath, okay? A psychopath has the underpinnings of, A, no ability – to have to have any bit of empathy whatsoever they can't understand it they don't get it and plus there's a psychotic process that goes underneath of it so we look at a serial killer right so you look at your ted bundy's of the world you look at your jeffrey dahmer's of the world and just remember that when you run out of food jeffrey dahmer will always say well we have each other oh bad joke horrible horrible joke so <laughs> They basically can't understand how to deal with other people. That's a psychopath. I don't have that ability. So ultimately, I want the world to burn, basically. And that's a, that's a psychopath. We can't teach them anything. Typically, a psychopath was was born that way. You know, we, we look at the nature-nurture versus thing. Sociopaths, typically, it's, it's nurture. They were basically made to be this way based on their their family based on things that have happened to them and so forth psychopaths are both born and created this way typically if you look back trauma in their in their lives there's typically sexual trauma 
so forth. Like these are people that grew up in just horrible situations, you know, and then somewhere along the line, they were also born with, you know, what we consider that, 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 that sycophant gene that, that, that's there, right? All right. So there we have all the definitions out. So when we call someone a psychopath, do we truly mean that? Or are we weaponizing the word to elicit a response from them? I mean, like I said, I don't most, answer that. Most of the people that use most of the people that use these words don't understand, right. um, or, or a vast majority of the people that use these words don't understand what what the actual definition is. They hear it, they repeat it. You know, if someone does something you don't like, you're a psychopath, or you, you right. somebody somebody acted out, somebody got angry, or somebody got momentarily violent, and they get called a psychopath for that moment. Right. Um, and and what they're doing then is they're labeling people. Right. You right. say it. You say it often enough, you repeat it often enough, it must become the truth at some point, right? Right. right. If, I, if I keep calling him a psychopath, more people will believe it, and maybe I can do damage to his reputation. Maybe I can do damage to his ability to form connections, things right. like that. So, um, yeah, they, that's, that's how they're weaponized. You saddle someone with this label by repeating it to whomever will listen, by saying it as often as you can, and, and at some point that label gets stuck to a person. Right. And, and it becomes the first thing people think about. Right. Especially in, in, in a small town, in an area like we live in, where everyone knows everyone. Delaware, we, we, we joke that we have like three degrees of separation, if, right? We, if if right. that. If. So you hear about who is labeled as a psychopath, right. who is right. a, a bad breaker-upper, who well, is a sex addict. Those horrible you, breaker-uppers. You hear about these people, <laughs> and, and the first thing you think about when you meet them is what you've heard from others. You don't even you don't know have the, the benefit of getting to know them with a clean right. slate. Like you, you hear term psycho chick, <laughs> Luna chick, you know, you, you hear these things that ultimately have, it, again, elicit a response to it. And I, and, and to that word, narcissism or narcissist has been in my, I, you know, in my humble opinion, and it's just me in the world. I think that word has been overly used in oh, the past Oh, it's just five you, years. the world revolves around yeah, you. Because it revolves. Because of your narcissism. Again, we talked about it, Mac Davis. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. But <laughs> remember that there's a difference between confidence and narcissism. If somebody is confident and they don't like you and they show that confidence, that doesn't mean they're a narcissist. It just means they're confident. Okay, they, a, a, a narcissist in and of itself, like we talked about, ultimately has a self-loathing. I, I met a guy once. You homes, can be an arrogant non-narcissist. You, you can be an arrogant asshole is what you can be, right? You know, I, I met a guy once. He was, you know, the product of all complete homeschooling and, and so forth. I mean, this was this was him in the world, you know, homeschooled from, from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, went to, I think, a three-person college and, and so forth. The guy was not a good-looking cat. I mean, he really wasn't. He was kind of frumpy, you know, just not a good-looking guy. But you would have thought, for God's sakes, that he was he was Henry Cavill. He was Superman himself of how he projected the way he thought he was put together. The narcissism in this guy was unreal. Or was he just confident? No, 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 no. This was crazy. He came in to see me because in my... In my little header in the in the website, it's you know Dennis Carradin, diplomat of the experts, you know blah blah blah. And there was the it, you know for the American Academy of Experts in in traumatic stress, the word expert was all that he needed to say. He came in to me and specifically said, "I am here because you are an expert, and only an expert can help me." Okay. Then. I went, Jesus God, I don't think God could help you right now, right? The, the level of narcissism was unreal. Guess how many sessions it took me to bring him to his knees? Three. Not even. <laughs> it took 12 minutes. But this is a narcissist. A narcissist will step on your neck. But if you say the right things to a narcissist, they crumble. Because ultimately, it's that self-loathing inside. He knew that he didn't match up. He knew he didn't deserve his wife. I mean, I know I don't deserve my wife, but he knows that he didn't deserve his wife. He knew that he didn't deserve what he had in life, but yet he put that out there so bad. But yet, when we see that, and we don't understand that ultimately these these guys and girls, because, hey, guess what? Newsflash, 
a woman can be a narcissist as well, not just dudes, that we can kind of crumble them pretty quickly because of how that self-loathing works. That's one thing. Now, if we weaponize that word, what does that ultimately do to somebody? I think it drives them insane. It may drive them to it. it may drive them to narcissism. Eventually, you say, I don't care and I'm going to be this way, right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, 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 think, we, I think we weaponize words to the point of agnosium, that we, we literally weaponize words just to elicit reactions, just to get people kind of put in their place. Well, I think we've got to the point where we, people have lost their ability to debate. People have lost their ability to, to convince or persuade. So what, what they have left is well, we're going to label everything we disagree with. We're going to label something. We're going we're gonna to label everyone we di- disagree with with a, a, with a negative term, right. some negative connotation. So now we've, we've stopped arguing on the merits, right. and, and we've started arguing on characteristics of it. He's a narcissist. Or she's a sociopath. Or, right. you know. So people have lost the ability to debate and to convince and to persuade. And now it's it's everything that we disagree with. We're just going to slap a label on it. Right. And, Be- and walk away. Right. We're just going to. Right, that's why he's that way. If he wasn't crazy, he would agree with me. He's a psychopath. We're going to go. <laughs> if he wasn't so full of himself, he would understand my point of being <clears throat> full of myself. Right. Stupid. Yeah. Stupid. Stop weaponizing words. There. That's there it is. <laughs> don't don't you topic. do that. Oh, uh, good one. Good one to come back from with, right. the, with the vid. All right. So, hey, uh, we're going to come back with topic number two, uh, but make sure you follow uh, follow us on the, on the web at thecopandtheshrink.com and get on those uh, social media vibes and, and follow us everywhere. But this is The Cop and the Shrink, and this is legitimately The Cop and the Shrink. He's back. You have seen their faces and read their stories. Our hospital heroes and first responders are remarkable, and their strength is inspiring as they continue to work around the clock in the fight against COVID-19. Our mission is to show these frontline workers that we support them through the simple act of providing them with a prepared meal. For a $6 meal donation, you could help a hospital hero in a struggling restaurant stay focused and positive through the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we still need your help to see our hospital heroes through this fight. Our heroes are why we do what we do, but you are the how. Text Hospital Heroes to 44321 to donate a meal to a hero. Please visit us at hospitalheroesfooddrive.org to learn more about our mission. Uh, and we are back. Welcome back to the Cop and the Shrink. We are tandem today. We got the Cop and the Shrink back. He's back from the vid, like we said. Yeah. Uh, thank you for following us. Make sure you follow us on the webs at uh, thecopandtheshrink.com. Uh, make sure you get on the social medias and uh, and find us out. And something fun, something fun, get on TikTok. We've been doing uh, sections of of the strange or bizarre laws in the United States. We have a couple. We're going to get Harold on to uh, doing a video of that tonight and get that up on TikTok. Uh, but again, everything that we have, it's the cop and the shrink, and, and, and you'll find us everywhere. And just also to uh, to thank, we have uh, Jim Wyatt out there. Again, if you're, if you're watching, you'll see it. It is uh, greatcigarreviews.com. Follow him. He has a whole line of merch in there uh, with a, a beer and a, a beer and a cigar uh, shirts and so forth. He actually came out with a really cool shirt uh, that had uh, the blue line on it. That all the do- all the uh, proceeds go to us. Okay. Go to uh, the trauma survivors. Go to the cop and the shrink for the regular content. And also remember, you can get some merch. I'm wearing it. If you're looking at it. Eh, eh, oh, there it is. So get some of your uh, Cop in the Shrink merch at thecopintheshrink.com. We, we always put up some fun stuff. We, we wear it out and about, and people never ask us anything. But we, we wear it. You know, it's, it's kind of cool. But anyway, hey. so we'll talk about our other stuff. We got, we got more. We, got, we always have our little stuff hanging around, so we'll talk about it in the last section. But topic number two, this one's near and dear to both of us. Because all three of us. All three of us. And, and Denny, Denny in here. Um, this one, this one, <laughs> this is one of those ones. Like I said, I came in filled with piss and vinegar with the, with these topics today. And I was thinking about it of the quote unquote normal parent, right? You know, the normal parent of the world and how they raise their kids. And you and I both, you know, we both have older and younger kids. 
I, I kind of win. <laughs> you win. I win with the youngest, and, uh, and, and both of our oldest are the same age, right? You know, so, so based on that, I thought, well, let's talk about a topic of how our professions view not only raising kids, but how we've raised our children and the way that we would maybe counsel other police, other therapists, of how you should and shouldn't raise, raise their children. Because when you look at it, some of these kids aren't well adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> they are not. I mean, you, you hear you hear the cliches all the time, right? The the worst the worst kinds of kids are the are the preacher's kids and the cops' kids, right? They, <clears throat> and we talked about this a little bit on, on our workup. And I said I said to you the one thing that I found is as as cops are raising their kids, the more we the more we clamp down, the more we tighten the screws down and try to keep things under control and sort of insulate and isolate them from the bad of the world right and, and the more we try to filter out the world the more ways they find to get around that the harder they'll try to come out from under the clamps right and figure out just what the hell it is you're trying to hide from me right, right. um so a, a lot of times you'll find that the cops kids are the rebellious ones um at, at least as they're going through that developmental part of their life i mean i don't know of many cops adult children who have right. really ended up like you, you hear there are the, the ratios, always going to be outliers the ratio is no higher for cops kids than it is for anybody else who who really truly go bad right right, right. it's just that those those rebellious those adolescent te- years those teen years when we're trying to control the rate of of maturing and we're trying to protect them from the bad things in the world the more we tighten the grip, the more they try to break free from it to see what we're hiding, so to speak. Um, so you, you find a lot of that, like pulling away, um, they'll you know disappear for a little while and come back, or or really rebel and see how far they can push you to right. break the rules. I mean, my poor kid's got two cops. Um, you know, she's she's got a detective for a mom and a commander for a dad. Like both people who are highly controlling, very very like inquisitive and, and dig in and right and so she this poor kid is 11 and she has learned half a dozen ways to get around the things that we've tried to keep from her at 11 so and does it, exceptionally well it, she, she does really well so it just goes to prove my point like that we try to protect them from the world and that that may not always be effective and it may not always actually be the wisest course of action you know if you want to protect them from the ugly the best thing to do is show them how ugly things can be i think right right um but you know i don't i can sit here and say that but i I don't subscribe to that i don't want her to be exposed to the ugly i don't want her to see the ugly so i i keep her from it and that's causing this rebellion that i'm living through now but it it's okay because i'd rather have a rebellious kid who's protected from the bad of the world than to turn her loose and have her experience it firsthand right now at 11. And and especially with everything that's been going on, I mean, my God, you know, you 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 turn a kid loose in our society right now, and and it could be deadly. I mean, let, let's be honest about it. That's why I'm not turning the six month old loose. Right. She, I mean, you know, we still got to take care of her. I guess I don't know. No, I mean, no. it, it's a different world, right? When I when I was growing up in the summertime, my mom would open the front door at seven a.m. and we would spill out of the house like all the kids at one time. All spill out of the house. We would go into the woods. We would go down under the bridge and the creek and play, and catch snakes, and set things on fire. All kinds of crap. And and we'd come back in time for like a peanut butter sandwich five hours later. Right, right. Then we'd disappear again until the and lights came. You would came drink on. out of the garden hose. No, we would drink out of the red clay creek <laughs> downstream from the factory. It just made sense. Everything it was made cool. sense. Yeah, yeah, it's a different world now. Like it, now we have parents who, and I'm one of those parents because maybe because of my profession or maybe because the world has made me that way. Right. But if if your child isn't visible from where you are, you you kind of get into a little bit of a heart oh, racing. God, yeah. Like so, it's a different. We would disappear all day, and our my dad took for granted when he stood at the end of the driveway and whistled, I'd be back. Right. I'd I'd hear it. Every dad in the neighborhood had a different whistle. We knew who was being summoned, and we would come back. And we we just – that's not the world we live in anymore. Well, you know, we, we come through, and I'll, I'll talk – because obviously my my oldest, my son, is our producer here, and, 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 you know, I love the man to death. He, you know, he does an excellent job. He puts up with our crap every day. But, you know, to translate a Generation X and our mentality to a millennial – you know, which sorry, Dan, you're you're 24. You're a millennial. That's what you are, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm 
not Gen X. He's not Gen X. Could be Gen Z. You're right on the maybe Gen Z. Maybe Gen Z. You're right on the threshold there. But how do I, you know, to translate that, to translate Gen X of what we did, like literally, we would go out and we were told come home when the when the uh, street light was on. So what did us knuckleheads do? Use our BB guns to shoot out the street Yeah, we, st- we either broke it or we stood under the one that was that was out. I was telling him, I told Denny, and I will never, ever, ever condone any of my children to do the, the garbage that I did. We used to live, we, where I live, we used to live near the train tracks, right? And so every now and then, box train would come by and we would hop on the train. You know, it wasn't like a like a standby me or oh, anything. That's right. You live near the near like the Union Street line. Yeah. <laughs> so, so each time that we did it, we would see how further we could go. You know, so so we would go from Wilmington. We would make it into Ellesmere. You know, and we were like, oh my God, the exchange in Ellesmere. Then you would walk home. It, it, you know, a half hour walk or whatever it is. Then you try it again. You make it up into Hokesson or something like that. And then it take like an hour and a half to walk home. And we did. We walked everywhere. That's what you did. You took your bike or you walked everywhere. It's it's all fun and games until you end up locked inside the Boxwood Road Beretta plant. Or you end up in Lancaster because you stayed on the train long enough to end up in Lancaster. Now, keep in mind, my friend, we're both Generation Xers. We didn't have cell phones back then. And then when you go up into Amish Paradise at age like 10 or 11, that you have been on that train <laughs> for three hours. three hours. And then you have to call your father, who, who just got off shift work, who's pissed off at the world, asking my younger brother where I was. And then I call from some 717 exchange that he didn't even know. And I had to do the... Well, you had to call, and what was I forget uh, the extension. I have a collect call from Dad. Pick me up at the outlet. <laughs> <laughs> no, he goes, "Where are you?" And I said, "Dad, you remember? You remember when we went up to go see those trains?" He goes, "Yeah." And you know all the Amish people. Are you in Lancaster? And I went, "I think so." <laughs> so. <laughs> and then I sit here and we laugh about that, but then I look at how goddamn ridiculous that was, you know. And, and there were things that we did that I think we we step back and and I tried to protect them, you know. And this was the this was the scene from all of our dinners because my parents are evil. I I love them to death, but they're evil because these two, my son and my older daughter, would come in and say, "Hey." tell us a story about dad, right? <laughs> and then that story would come in. Well, your knucklehead father ended up in Lancaster while he jumped the rails. And then they would turn around going, ooh, damn, you won't even let us go over to so-and-so's house. And I was like, because he's an asshole. I don't want you to go over to that guy's house. <laughs> Regardless, I to, to make them understand what Generation X is to a millennial is almost damn impossible. So let's put that out. There, there's no way we could translate that our world that we live in yeah our world however i think there's a difference based on our professions of how we raise the kids like you said you clamp them down you ask a ton of questions me it was about how do you feel right and denny even self-admitted when we were when we were sitting around he's that, a narcissist that he's a narcissist <laughs> no that he we sat around and he goes yep even i fooled around and found out that that dad may be right on things and that's okay that's okay but are we <laughs> lack of a better term are we screwing them up because of our professions are we screwing up our kids yes <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. You hear you hear arguments made both ways, right? You hear arguments saying if you if you isolate them or if you insulate them from the world, you're not preparing them to go out into it, right? You have to right. let them experience it. In my in my opinion, that's what college is for. Right. That's not what middle school is for. Like right, I right. I shouldn't be letting her go out now into the world and and seeing what it's all about. Her worldview should be based on what I allow her to see. Um and and you can prepare as you get older. You can prepare for going right. out in the world. So some people will say that protecting them and, and and insulating them is doing them a disservice because you're not preparing them. Right. And we, we talk about it when we teach our classes about stress inoculation and things right, like right. that. Well, I, I don't believe in world inoculation at no, at the age no. of eleven. You know, you can start preparing them for the world when they're sixteen and they get in a car to drive. Right. You can prepare them for the world when they're 18 and you're going to take them, you're going to drop them off at college right, in two right, months. Right. That's when you can start sort of talking to them about 
how to prepare for the ugliest of the ugly things in the right. world. But I, I don't, and obviously I'm, I'm a biased commentator here, but I don't have a problem with kind of just keeping that hedge of protection around our kids as they're, as they're growing up, try to maintain some of the innocence that this world used to appreciate. Right. Now everybody wants all these kids to be full grown at age four. They want to expose them to oh, all God. sorts of ridiculous things. And let's, oh. let's legalize everything and let's have nine year olds smoking pot. And, you know, let's, let's not, let's not, you know, stigma. Let's not attach a stigma to having sex when, whenever you feel like it. Right. But no, let's keep it. Let's keep let's some sort of competition. Innocence. Let's keep yeah. some sort of protection around our kids. Um, I agree. And, I agree. And, and put, so it's not just the way we, we, try to protect them. It's not just the way we clamp down on them either. That the kids that are raised by cops and by, by trauma shrinks and people who who go out into the world at a moment's notice or work weird hours or work weird days, the, the kids experience life differently than their friends anyway, right? Like I, I've been working 25 and a half years as a police officer and for all but 13 months of that, I've worked shift work yeah. and I've worked rotating days for all but 13 months of that. So a lot of nights, evenings, mm -hmm. I'm not home to do homework, put her to bed. A lot of mornings, I'm out the door at 4 o'clock, so I'm not there to wake her up and get her ready for school. I've missed birthdays. I've missed holidays. And, and it's true of every police officer. Right, right. And she's got two of us. Thankfully, we're able to work it out, so there's always one of us available. <laughs> but it's it's super uncommon for all three of us to be together at the same time. Most right. most families have family time every evening and every weekend in, right. in, in the – in the nine to five world, right? right? In the construction worker, in the banking, corporate world. Most families have their their core family, their nuclear family together at nights and on the weekends and things like that. And our kids don't. We get called as an added component right, to, right. to the police officer schedule. We get called for other things outside of our working hours. Right. What <laughs> During the times that should be our family time, we get called and we answer and we go away for additional time. Right. And, so our kids get used to that, and I, I think that my daughters were pretty strong with understanding right. that and working through it. Um, it. They can get used to it, but they but they do experience the world differently from their friends, and they realize that and they recognize like, hey, you know, my friend, you know, my friend Mandy and her parents did this, or they spent the weekend together, or or they sit at the dinner table and have dinner every night. They don't eat pizza right. off of tray tables watching Marvel movies. That's, you know, I mean. Sounds like fun. <laughs> well, no, I I completely agree with you. I think it, you know, it, it it's been as of late that that I actually started and you know started talking to the older two. Yeah, I I, I talked to the six month old, but she just giggles and you know that's a, that's she doesn't care anything right about herself. She she doesn't know. She's not even a narcissist yet. But so I, as of late, I started talking to Denny and Melina about about what I have done in my life. Like there, there were points, and you know he could agree. I know Molina would agree that they had no clue to some of the places that I've been and some of the things that I've seen and and some of the things that I've done and so forth. When we went down to uh, New Orleans, uh, what two years now, right before the uh, right before the shutdown, when I went to New Orleans, I started talking to Molina about yeah, you know when we were down there, and I was I, I was telling her about the four months I spent during Hurricane Katrina. And that was the first time I think she heard. I think Denny heard it before. She was like, "Well, what did you really do down there?" And we started talking about, you know, going through the, going through the uh, the pockets of the new and old dead that had been flooded out. And I was telling them about, you know, going, you know, trying to find these these different bodies and and trying to hook families up. And I had her at one point where she was crying where she couldn't get a breath. She was crying that hard. And I was like, honey, why? What, what's wrong? I'm just telling you what I was doing. And she goes, I had no clue. I missed all of your life. And I was like, no, that was four months of my life. I was like, okay, dr dramatic and, much. And you missed it by design. <laughs> yeah, right? I was like, I didn't tell you that because of how messed up it is. <laughs> but my wife and I still talk about yeah. our our day-to-day -day work yeah. in code. We use 10 codes and we use dispatch codes. You know, we use... We use abbreviations, like right. we use cop jargon, and the kid's looking at us, and she says, "Why, why do you people talk about everything in code? Because <laughs> you don't need to hear this shit, sweetheart. Because you, you don't, don't. You don't. Is so, there... I mean, for your for for your daughter to feel like, oh, she missed part of your life. I mean, the thing she needs to know is that she missed it by design. Like, right. She didn't miss it. You 
You insulated her from it. You, well, trying to, but then do I do a disservice to him for not telling them everything that I do? Now, you know, and, and keep in mind that we're not, you know, there, there's a difference, I think, in, in how we operate versus, say, like your normal every other day shrink or your normal every other day cop. Because of that added element of trauma and trauma care, you know, there's an added element to it. When when I think both my son and daughter, you know, found out that, oh, yeah, dad was at the Vegas shooting, dad was at the Parkland shooting, dad was up at Sandy Hook and, and so forth. And when they started realizing that, holy Christ, he goes to these things, and, and this is pretty wild, you know, they can't translate that to, say, another another mother or father that's a therapist you know that comes in and goes i talked to somebody very anxious today and we tried to help them and they're like yeah yeah my dad got shot at <laughs> you know they're i you know you try to insulate it but then when it comes out and you see that visceral response now also keep in mind and then he's over there and hold admit to it that his sister my my oldest daughter may or may not be a little dramatic on things <laughs> <laughs> the, the red hair gives it away. I mean, she is wonderful. We love Melina to death, but she has the flair for the dramatic. But just to see that visceral response, it's like, oh my God, you do this. That's there. It's it's if if your daughter finds out, and I think your oldest knows, <laughs> the youngest may not, that you've had to lock up people that killed somebody. You know, that you've had to put your hands on somebody that may or may not have killed a child. Is that that realization, I think, sometimes comes into the child's mind. And then they could either, A, say, well, dad's a hero for doing that and use the term hero. We talked about that, or I talked about that at our, at our last one. Dad's a hero and you are no longer human to them. Or, well, dad shows off and then they take it, they rail against so I, 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 it's kind of wild because you're not going to see that. Like, okay, you have dad who works for PennDOT or Dell Dot. You know, well, my dad, you know, my dad, you know, builds this, or my dad, you know, fills in potholes or something like that. It's not there. There's an it, you admire that. I think that's a job. It's it's a worthwhile profession. It's something that people should be very proud of their parents for. But when you talk about life versus death. I think that that sets kids apart from other kids. Just my thoughts. Yeah, and and that's <clears throat> it's those life versus death things that we try to insulate them from. We we downplay like nobody's business the 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 risk inherent to the job, right? Right. We, she watches the news and she sees the things about the cops assaulted and the cops killed, and yep. and she she sees all those things, and we we always try to kind of put them in like far flung places right. like that. We're always telling her, thankfully, that doesn't happen here. She knows very little about the event that happened in Wilmington. Oh, um, nor does she need to know. She doesn't need to know because that was close to home. Right. It was very close to home, and she doesn't need to know about that. So we kind of try to push it off and downplay, like, that's happening far. That's that's happening in Chicago. That's happening in Los Angeles. That's right. happening in Atlanta. And these are places that she hasn't been, yeah. that she's not familiar with. So there's that there's that air of separation that it, right. it doesn't hit her so close to him. And then we talk about the bad things that happen to other people in code. Yeah. And so she can pick up that something shitty happened, but right, she doesn't right. know what. Has she figured out 1081 yet? No. I don't, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think she figured it out anything. Unless she's taking notes. She may at some she, point be able to do like a logic problem and figure out what some of these 10 codes mean. She's damn intelligent, man. She, she's a smart one. So I don't know. I think she'll figure it out. She'll figure us out. She'll Google point. it. <laughs> I, you know, and it's funny. I have to give credit, again, because he's sitting right across from us. I'll give him credit. If he wasn't here to hell with him, I wouldn't. No, no, no. But my son, it was funny. We did the uh, we did that uh, New Year's Eve event down at the Showboat Casino, right? You know, so that was, you know, for, for people that know that, you know, for the past few years, we've rented out the Trauma Survivors Foundation. We've rented out uh, the Showboat Resort with our help from our folks at upcoming events, and we're the charity of it this this uh, casino in Atlantic City and we have this huge New Year's Eve event this year was you know over 3,000 people and so forth and we have these events we have these pretty large events that that we do and I think this was the first year that Denny came down with me he was my New Year's Eve date which was fun we we went down to down the showboat he looks at me and he goes this is pretty wild (laughs) and I was like I keep telling you to come down with me with these things and to come to help out and he goes 
yeah, but this is pretty wild. And then, <laughs> and, and in all due of his credit, which was, I think, kind of funny because this boy does crack under pressure pretty quickly. So there was a, there was a good looking bartender down there. Okay, and I'm talking shit about Denny right now because he's here. I, you know, I, you know, I love him that much. Give me six schlitzes. Well, I, I wish he. Did. She goes. So, honey, what, what do you want? And you know, right? And and we've talked about this. We've talked about it that I love if I go to a diner, and I have that server call me, sweetie pie, honey. Well, you, I'm giving you a thousand percent tip because man, stroke my ego away, right? So this no, good-looking says, bartender looks at Denny and goes, all right, sweetie, what do you want? Or what, what do you want, honey? And he goes, I'll take a rum and Coke. And I went, <laughs> I went what, are, you a, are you a 73-year-old man at a wedding? <laughs> Give me a virgin Cuba Libre. <laughs> yeah, he, he changed it up. He just went straight for a shot of tequila with a with – a, uh, no, I, I, it was fun. But I think it's when they find us out and they find out what we do – we have to play it right. We have to say these are the things that we did, and and not in a bad way, but we have to educate. So I don't think we're screwing them up. I think we we have to educate because obviously the nine to five parent screws their kids up just as much as we screw them mm-hmm. up. You know, God, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe worse, maybe better, but it's cool. I like it. I like it. All right. (laughs) Topic number two. Take us out, my friend. Well, first, I, you know, I appreciate all the, (laughs) I appreciate all our viewers and listeners for not jumping ship on us last week. It was just the narcissistic shrink. Um, Thanks for coming back to see my triumphant return from SARS Cove 2. Uh, In our next segment, we're going to be talking about the things that grind our gears. A little bit of current events, a little bit of political topics, just uh, kind of a free for all on the, on the things (laughs) happening in the world right now. So, Join us back here for the cop and the shrink. (laughs) The Division of Wellness Services of the National Fraternal Order of Police is committed to leading the efforts to ensure the well-being of law enforcement officers. The FOP intends to no longer react to issues of critical stress affecting its members, but instead take a pre-act approach that is driven by trained peer support, research, empowerment of officers, awareness, and stigma reduction, connections to service, and ongoing training and development. Information about the Wellness Division, resources, and publications can be found at fop.net front slash officer wellness. Donations to the National FOP in support of their Division of Wellness Services and other programs can be made online at nfop.firstresponderprocessing.com. Well, <laughs> welcome back to the Cop and the Shrink. <laughs> our, our, our outro was uh, was there. We were talking about cracking under pressure. You know, it's the and then it we did. And then we did. Then we did. So, <laughs> welcome back to the Cop and the Shrink. Let's uh, get some of our stuff out of the way. Remember, 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 not only to follow us on the webs, but follow some of our partners on the webs. Please go to Wagon House Winery. Uh, it's wagonhousewinery.com. Uh, dot com. Check out. Uh, the Captain's Punch, the proceeds go over to our favorite, the Trauma Survivors Foundation, also our Hospital Heroes Food Drive, an excellent red sweet wine any time of the year. Also check out our partners over at Big Oyster Brewery. Big Oyster uh, from Philadelphia all the way out to Pittsburgh has Survivors IPA. They're still in stores, you can make sure. We're looking at redesigning it a little bit. We talked about that, So, but check out Big Oyster Brewery. And da, 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 the redesign survivorscoffee.com you can still go to drinksurvivors.com but survivorscoffee.com it's a redesigned website we're relaunching it um fresh coffee right to your house i had um we bought the k cups to it do we call them k cups now the uh, curry cups um, whatever those cups are the single serves <clears throat> uh fresh single coffee with coffee pods How about that? <laughs> <laughs> but you can get those there and hey promo code yummy y-u-m-m-y yummy you can get it for 25 percent off anything on the store we actually have flasks and mugs and coffee makers nice i i actually got not only did i get the k-cups but i had ordered they have a uh this one over here the cowboy blend so my partner and i here are the the same mindset of coffee is that coffee should be used 
in every avenue possible, celebratory, wake you up in the morning, funerals, whatever it is, it should be used and reveled in and, and so forth. Uh, but the cowboy blend literally is, is a nice little kick in the morning. So get the cowboy blend, get the Brazil blend, whatever it is. But go to survivorscoffee.com, uh, promo code YUMMY for 25% off. So there we go. We got all that out of the way. That's Alrighty. awesome. We're, we're running with it. So. <laughs> do you know what grinds my gears? <laughs> grinds my gears. So we could do, we could do two things. Two? Uh, two, two things. <laughs> As I put up four. There's so much because I got, and, and we're going to run with it a little bit, but first let's 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 go on a little solemn note and then start kind of discussing a little bit because I think this grinds both of our gears to the point of literal collapse. So in the past month, past month alone across the <coughs> nation, we have had minimally two dozen police deaths, all line of duty deaths. And in our area, in the tri-state area, including New York in there, we have had five total I think it's been five yeah. i think it's been five within within the past two month. in manhattan last week so. and and one being a 22 year old officer which is just horrible we also lost and and god bless him we also lost three firefighters in in baltimore uh the other day and why we're saying it grinds our gears because where is the outcry and and what the hell is going on with this why is it that a cop dies and there is no outcry? And why is it that we almost we find people almost reveling in a cop's death? <clears throat> I'm putting that to you first because I, I will start cussing up a storm with this one. And I'll tell you, I <clears throat> and I, I touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, the the current political Climate, cable news, entertainment, atmosphere, the, the current universe around what's popular to say and what's popular to think right now um, is is largely based on cops are bad. Right. That's we've been hearing that um, we've we've been hearing that for many years now. Right. Um, but in the past two years, it's really it's really kicked up a notch. And 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 it's the popular thing to say and the popular thing to believe is that for some reason cops have become the enemy, that law enforcement is the enemy of the people. When, you know, 20 years ago, short 20 years ago, cops and firefighters were were the princes of this country. Right, right. Um, everybody wanted, you know, hug a cop, hug a hero. Um, you know, the, the, the public safety community, the cops, firemen, EMS, dispatchers, everybody was placed on a pedestal right. in this country following uh, the, the events of 9-11, and it's been... It's been deteriorating since. Right. And now the, the popular thing to say, the popular thing to believe is that law enforcement is the enemy. Right. Um, giving no credence at all to the fact that cops hate bad cops as much as the rest of you do. Right. We don't want people to besmirch our good reputation. We don't want people to blemish our proud traditions and our proud agencies we don't want that any more than anyone else does. When when someone does something that's wrong, when someone when, when someone in our profession wearing our badge does something egregious, we don't want to protect them any more no. than anyone else does. And they we we've got this we've got this misperception or this misinformation that there's this blue line of protection that we throw up a wall and protect the people who are bad when nothing can be further from the truth. Right. And when you see right. agencies now, especially in the in in the in the area, or I'm sorry, in the in the world of body worn cameras, when there's clear evidence that a cop has has committed misconduct and has has injured somebody and in, in a criminal way, police departments are quick to discipline that person internally and, when appropriate, charge them criminally right. and get rid of them and get them out of the profession and make sure that they never work in it again. Right. Right. So right. cops are being fired. Cops are being prosecuted and punished for bad acts. Because we don't want them to be part of us either. These are these are people that we invite to our homes. These are people we socialize right. with. These are people that affect the way the West, the rest of the world perceives us. And we don't want to be around people who don't share our values. Right. And right. despite what they tell you on The View and despite what they tell you in Hollywood and on the cable news channels, our values are not to hurt people no. or to control people no. or to protect bad actors. No. Our values are... What it says on the site, service and dedication, protect and serve, public safety. It, 
if if us enforcing the law gets in the way of the lawbreakers, so be it. Right. But we're not the enemy of the people that so many would have you believe. And, right. And I think it's become so easy to hate the police now because of this constant 24-hour-a-day barrage of cops are the enemy, cops are bad, you know, F-12 and ACAB. I, it, it's become this constant 24-hour-a-day barrage that that it's it's become easy to assault the police and to hate the police. And it, it's something that people don't don't think about. They're just, they're just out there doing it. Well, and okay. And that's what grinds my <laughs> gears. What, but... But in all truth to it, are they not thinking about it? Because I think they are. So I, I so and I'll call. I, I, I won't name him, but he's a jerk off. But this this congressman, that or it's a representative, excuse me, uh, from this area, that uh, on the anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting, right on the on the murders, he had posted something that said, uh, "I'm attending a vigil." for the lives lost at Sandy Hook and God bless them and so forth. And then right afterwards, he put this salacious cartoon of a officer being shot in the head. And I lost my goddamn mind on it. And I went and, and basically said, how dare you? How dare you put one post that says you're going to the solemn moment for the 26, you know, that, that had died at Sandy Hook, but yet you put a post about an officer being shot in the head. His response was, well, you don't understand my post. And I said, well, you don't understand what it was like for those police to walk in to find children dead. How many ways can you rate. interpret that cartoon, by the way? Yeah, what, I, what, there's what no other I, interpretation. What did I fail to understand about the murder of a cop? And and this this is one that you know his, his all of his postings are pretty pretty out there. They're you know he's obviously a cop hater or whatever it is. But these are the pieces of garbage that somehow get elected. But yet they're the first ones. They're the first ones that if anything ever happens to them, they're calling the police. They're the first ones throwing up the red flag saying, "Oh my God, you know look what happened. Somebody trespassed. Somebody carjacked me. Somebody whatever it was." But so I went after him a little bit, and, I, I, and, and again, he ended up taking the post down. And I don't know if it was just my doing or other as, people. As cowards will. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I told him. And so I loved what he said. He, he goes, you don't, know, you don't know what you're talking about. And I went, oh, oh, I don't? And, and, and rarely do I use my position in a power statement. I, I rarely do I use you know, this. I actually, in the post, I said, this is offensive to everybody that was up there. I said, do you realize that most of these shootings, most of these school shootings, most of these <laughs> world shootings, that it's the police that stop further death? That this is something that if they, if they can get to the target prior to them killing more people, then people ultimately don't die for no other reason because of a psychopath, right? So I continued a little bit, and I, I browbeat this guy, basically saying, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you know, I don't do anything for social gratification or anything. But when you start getting like twenty thousand likes and forty thousand likes on my posts, and like zero on his shit, there's something to be said that there might be that underpinning that we could say not everybody's against the cops, but why in the hell is this vocal minority getting heard? And, and, and why are our representatives, people of the people, that ultimately have created these laws that the, that the police have to enforce, why are they turning their backs? That grinds my gears because it pisses me off. It, <laughs> Answer me! <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> elected officials, traditionally, especially representatives, senators, council people, elected officials are there to write laws and right. write ordinances and, and govern. But they've gotten away from that. Now, in almost every case, every politician is only worried about one thing, the outcome of the next, next election. election. Yeah. So everything that's become popular in the evil world of social media, everything that's been, become popular on the cable news cycle, everything that's, that's popular to say and to hear and to tweet about and to sing about is what it, are the views that they will claim that they hold. It's what they will espouse. Right. Okay, well, if if the popular thing to say is all cops are bastards, then then I believe that too. And if the right. popular thing to say is defund the police, then I think we should defund the police. And 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 you know, if 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 homicides are up in my city, it couldn't possibly be because of because of society or because of violent young street gangs. It must be because I don't have any confidence in the chief of police. Right. 
it must be because I've heard from one or two people that morale is low without checking, without checking, mind you, with with the rank and file of the police department to see if they feel morale is low. I guarantee right. you that they don't. Right. I guarantee you everything that was said about morale and attitudes inside that police station, everything that was said at that council meeting by council people about the morale and about the attitudes of the men and women at the police department, 100% false. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and let's kind of look across the nation right now. We have we are coming out of, well, it's still continuing, the deadliest of two years that we've ever had in the nation with murders. Deadliest. Highest rates of crime in the nation in two years. The cops aren't committing those crimes. Exactly right. It's So we look at them and say, defund the police, but then all of a sudden we have murders that are going through the roof. We have crime going through the roof. Christ, in this area we have a, a, a two or three crime sprees with children. They're teenagers that are stealing cars, that are carjacking, robbing. We got we got a crime spree right now in Philadelphia. It's been, I think, 11 fast food restaurants that have been robbed by this group that are actually very meticulous in how they rob the place. They're very organized. But a group of about 8, 15 to 17-year-olds. The cops are not committing the crime. So why do we put them on the pedestal, or why why are we trying to slaughter them on the on the on the altar of public opinion? The the cops are the government. The cops are the most visible arm of the executive branch of right. every government. Right, right. We're out there in uniform, easily identifiable, easy to target, easy to see, easy to criticize. But what we're doing is we're out there carrying out what these people who are writing the laws and writing the ordinances have created. Right. They create the laws and then they send us out into the world to enforce the laws. And then when we do and somebody disagrees with the way that it's done or with the person that's been arrested or it's it's easy to criticize us because we're so visible. Not right. not even considering that we are we are the executive branch and the legislative branch is has created the things that have sent us out into the world. Which is it's again, it's mind boggling because you're tell, you're you're sending the lambs to the slaughter at that point. You really are. You're setting people up. You're setting police up for failure. You, you, you truthfully are. And whether it's this administration or any other administration that has done that, you know, you have politicians in this world right now. And we're, we're a fairly non-political podcast. We've, we've remained fairly non-political and just kind of talk about things. But, but quite honestly, I, it, it boggles my mind to see that public officials are now railing against police in the way that they're railing against police. And it's not about just bad police. It's just police. You know, it it it, it literally it not only grinds my gears, it gets me almost speechless because I when I view things like this, and, and we just recently had, you know, a city council member, uh, president of a city council, voted no confidence in a police chief that's probably been one of the best police chiefs in, in, in our city for, I don't know, 40 years? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's an exciting exaggeration. At least in the past 10, right? Okay. So comes out and says there's a vote of no confidence. And why? Because he felt there was. No, that's all it, it was. It, and I don't even think that's it. It's what I said. It, it's about the next election, right? It's about what's popular. Oh. I think that a certain city council president wants to run for mayor. And uh, I think that the, uh, that the most vocal... Um, the most populist voices in his council are saying defund the police, prosecute the police, right. disband the police, citizens review board. And if he wants to get any traction on his mayoral campaign, he has got to echo those loudest of the voices on his council. I think because eight months ago, the man was was praising Chief Tracy and praising right. the police department for the progress it's made in violent crime, for the progress it's made towards diversifying the police force, right. for the makeup of the academy class and how proud he was that it represented the city. The same councilman, believe it or not, had said this, has said these things eight months ago. So, and, and now he has no confidence in the chief's ability to reduce violent crime, to improve morale, to field uh, a, a diverse field of police officers. So he has completely reversed course in the last eight months. And this is because of the loudest and most anti-police voices in his council are, are influencing him in that direction. So here's my question. Do we have to live in the city of Wilmington to be mayor of yes. Wilmington? Damn yes, it. you do. 
Damn. Although <laughs> although this this council president thought it was okay to move out of his council manic district but hold the seat. seat. Uh, so so you there's know, a workaround. The rules are for thee, but so not I for me. So I can still live in PA, and and run for it. No, I. <laughs> although although we have to admit to this, we did get 120 votes in the past election. <laughs> For, for the the Keratin Bozeman or the Bozeman Keratin ticket, 120 votes. 120 votes for that. That's not too bad. And l- I'm proud to say that's <laughs> that, that's the that most votes I've ever received. He wants to yell in on this one. That's the most votes I've ever received in a presidential election. I know. I felt kind of you know as VP, I would have been excited. Go ahead, Dan. Yell it. So with con- councilmen's, uh, they can't. They, I mean, well, Dr. Ross, he lives oh, in Jersey. Oh. Yeah. And he's running for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Senate? Because he maintains a house in PA. Ah. So if you rent a house, you don't have to buy it. You have to rent it and call it a resident. Then you could do that. That's what Hillary Clinton did in New York. And 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 Matt Walsh, so he could go speak up at the at the uh, school board meetings in Virginia. Yeah, rented true. a house in the school district. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Emmett Oz, who, who is running for Pennsylvania uh, governor? Senate. Senate, sorry. Senate. 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 He maintains a house uh, that uh, apparently is rented. I don't know if it, if he purchased it or not, but he does live in Jersey, and he's maintaining a quote-unquote address in it, which we could talk about him for forever and a day with this. So it's I am not sure his his background to be in Senate except for— what, But what does your background have to be? Well, I, I think I would <clears throat> think somewhere along the line service— like you would have had to have been either military, you would have had to have been uh, police. Now, this is just me. I know it's total bullshit, but I'm just throwing this out. Police, you'd have to be a first responder. You'd have to be military somewhere in the legal council. I mean, apparently you, you can get to... all the way to Capitol Hill being a bartender with panty picks on the web. So, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, what <laughs> what's she got that Dr. Oz don't got? I got, yeah, no, you're right. 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 I don't know. I don't know. But yes. That to answer your question, he maintains, quote unquote, maintains a house there. Now, so, to your point, you well, you, I could you rent. cannot you cannot run for city council president or mayor in Wilmington unless you reside. The city charter is probably a little more clear, I guess, than the than the state laws of Pennsylvania. The city charter says it requires that you reside, that it's that it's your place of residence in, in Delaware. In the city of Wilmington. In Delaware. Like in the city of Wilmington in Delaware. Yes. So I could have a vacation home in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you could. You could have a vacation home. Do I have to get mail in Delaware, I guess? Well, that would be bills. So Driver's license, registration, ah, car insurance, utilities. Psh, psh. You live in the office. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. The office isn't in the city limits. It's not in the city limits. So we have to. So anybody selling a home in 40 acres. No, I, 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 no, I'd be horrible. I we got full skeleton. so far off course. My yeah, we did, we did. We, our gears got grinded, and then it came to a grinding halt. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway. So bottom line is, look, you know, it's popular to basically dump on police at this point, but when we really look at things, you know, we, 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 the people, have to change the mindset to this. You know that. This vocal minority needs to be, I don't know, needs to not necessarily silence because I think everybody deserves their fair shake. Everybody deserves to say what they say. It's it's our country. It is still a free country. The last time I checked, except we pay for taxes. But anyway, that's something else. The idea is is that the the minority or the majority should start talking about this. The majority of people, which I personally believe, I could be wrong, but I think the majority of people want police around. Even the people who say they don't want police around. Let let one of the let one of the vocal anti-cop politicians plan an event where oh. they think there might be some pushback or where they think there might be some some opposition forces and 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 take a look at who they ask to to form a perimeter oh, around yeah. their event. Oh yeah. They're not getting privatized security. No. No, they're they're asking the police. They want the there. police there. Oh God, you know, it, it no matter what. I just don't know I don't know how you go to bed at night understanding that you just took a dump all over the people that just protected you. I, I don't know how you live with yourself. That goes to our first topic of being a narcissist. 
possibly a sociopath. Not saying all politicians are that way, because there are some lovely politicians that we've met, some amazing people. We may not agree with all of their policy. We may not, but we do agree with them being people. But let's be honest. <laughs> to, to stand in a pulpit and say, you should give me the authority to lead you, that kind of requires a touch of the narcissism, don't you think? Oh, oh God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I think, you know, what is it? A good leader... A good leader develops a team around them that the team, you know, protects them as well as fights for them. You know, you go back to, what was it, the movie 300 and the legend of King Leonidas and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You know, you had one unit, but ultimately you knew who the king was, right? You know, there has to be a touch of, touch of arrogance. You know, you have to have it as a leader. But do you need it as narcissism? No, but, go, you, but you get the narcissism you get whether the you narciss like it or not. <laughs> and we go full circle. It is the circle of life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, good topics, my friend. It was a good night. We got to get, get, get back into it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's all our stuff. That's it. So this is The Cop and the Shrink. <laughs> Make sure you follow us. Listen to us on thecopandtheshrink.com. Listen to us on where you listen to your podcast. Spotify seems uh, to be the most popular, but we're on Applecast. We're on Anchor. We're on a whole bunch of other places. And you know what? I think we should probably start another podcast. I heard Spotify just opened up some bandwidth. Oh. <laughs> so real quick before we go, I, if, if there is a listener out there that you put on our comment section that you actually like Neil Young's songs, please put it on there because I can't find anybody in my circle of influence that likes Neil Young's songs. Me, 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 me. That's what I hear when I hear him. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm a dick. I don't know. Maybe I'm a narcissist because I don't like Neil Young songs. Listen, the first person who emails us a screenshot of their iTunes library that's got more than one Neil Young song on it, I will send you we, yeah, a bag yeah, of the Cowboy yeah. Blend. We are going to send you coffee. if, And this has to be an old Spotify list. We have to have a dated list. <laughs> and, and you were most likely born before 1975, I'm saying. <laughs> Probably born in the 60s. I'm, I'm just saying yeah, that. Anyway. I was born before 1975. Yeah, that's I don't have I, any Neil I Young. Can't. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, That's going to be our other section as we continue with it. We're ready to sign off, but that's a whole other thing. It's going to be, it's going to be a whole other section of what are popular things that people like that we hate, that, that we absolutely hate. Neil Young songs. <laughs> I don't like Willie Nelson songs either. Look, I know that's not popular. But I don't like Willie Nelson's songs either. I don't like his voice. I think Mr. Snurdly wants us to wrap it up. Okay, we're wrapping up. Oh, anyway, this was the Cop and the Shrink. <laughs> Listen to us when you can. Copandtheshrink.com. Be safe, everyone. Have a good night.